Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 26 which is on particle physics. In our first video I'm going to talk about atomic structure and radioactivity. Um, so you'll know by now that atoms of all the elements are made up of three uh, particles called protons, neutrons and electrons and protons and neutrons as you can see here they're at the center of the atom and the electrons are or orbiting uh, the, the center of the atom. The center of the atom is what we call the nucleus and you're going to find that the diameter of the nucleus is about a ten thousandth uh, the diameter of the atom. So the essentially, you know, the atom is a whole lot of empty space. Um, and what I've drawn here is not really to scale. What I've drawn here on the left-hand side is a helium atom, and on the right-hand side is a lithium atom. So what, what, um, what can we glean from this? So I'll, I'll give you some data here first. Uh, so protons and neutrons... So one proton and one neutron have, uh, we, we, we say that they have one atomic unit of mass, right? So we'll call them one U. And in terms of SI units, it is uh, a very small mass. So that is the, the mass of, uh, we call it one atomic unit, atomic mass unit, and that is uh, the same as the mass of a proton or a neutron. Um, in comparison, the mass of an electron uh, is actually very, very small. It is about, I'll say, approximately equal to one two thousandth of an atomic unit. Um, so the vast majority of the mass of the atom is therefore in the nucleus of this atom, right? Um, what we also know is the, uh, the electron also carries, and I'll use a different color for this, the electron carries a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs, right? So it carries, and, and it's simply referred to as one minus one e to denote that it's a negative charge. And your uh, your proton, um, the proton here, um, use blue for this. Um, one um, a proton's charge is basically equal to uh, one e as opposed to minus one e for the electron. We'll just call it plus one e. And uh, it, is, it is numerically equal to 1.6 times 7 negative 19 coulombs. It's just a different uh, sign in front of it, right? And neutrons carry, uh, the neutrons, I'm going to use red for this, the neutrons carry zero uh, charge. So this is what the structure of the nucleus looks like. Um, let's go through definitions uh, a little bit more uh, about atoms and ions and proton number and nucleon number. And then that's gonna arm us to you know, uh, be able to discuss more interesting topics. Atoms are uncharged because they are going to contain an equal number of protons and electrons. And the charge on an electron is equal and opposite to the charge on a proton, right? So if an atom loses one or more electrons such that it does not contain number an, equal, uh, an equal number of protons and electrons, it becomes charged and it's called an ion, right? So for example, if sodium a sodium uh, atom uh, loses an electron, you, you will have basically an electron plus uh, the atom itself is going to be negatively charged. So we at this point, we call this a sodium ion. Um, and if you, you know, follow through your chemistry here, it's a positively charged ion, so it's going to be called cation, right? And if you, um, I'm going to write it on in a different color here so you don't confuse it with what the rest of what we're talking about here. Uh, the negatively charged ion would be called anion, right? So generally metals will take on a positive charge, non-metals will take on a, a negative charge. So here I've tried to write the, the opposite situation. In this case, chlorine gains an electron. So it has an excess of a negative charge and it becomes a chlorine ion. And that, uh, that right there is an anion. So you can gain an electron, become a negatively charged ion. You can lose an electron and become a positively charged ion. So let's look at a few more definitions uh, along the way. So we can use this kind of representation uh, to identify a particular atom of this element X, so where X is the chemical symbol from the periodic table. So this kind of representation, guys, is called a nuclide. As opposed to, like, you know, I'm not calling it the element itself, I'm calling it a nuclide. What do I mean by this? Okay, the element changes for every Z number. Z number is the number of protons, right? So if you have a different number of protons, you're changing the element. You're going from sodium to magnesium and so on. 
the uh, uh, so that your symbol X is going to change when when the when the Z number changes. A nuclide is a name that's given to a class of atoms whose nuclei uh, contain a specific number of protons and a, spe uh, and, and a specific number of neutrons. So for instance, you could have sodium that looks like this. So it has 11 protons and 12 neutrons. So 11 plus 12 is going to be equal to 23 right here, right? So this is a nuclide of uh, nucleus. So all atoms with nuclei that contain 11 protons and 12 neutrons would belong to this class and are in fact the same nuclide. However, you could also have uh, you could have sodium with 11 protons but 13 uh, neutrons and as a result of that 13 plus 11 is 23 so you have now what we call an isotope so these guys are isotopes of of sodium so they have the same number of uh, protons but they have a different mass number they have a different uh, number um, of uh, nucleons essentially that is what makes them isotopes of the same element. So probably the most common um, uh, isotopes that you're gonna encounter at this level in your studies will be on chlorine. It's so much so that like, you know, you have, um, if you go and look at the periodic table and you look at the mass number on a periodic table, you're gonna find that uh, the chlorine, uh, chlorine's uh, mass number is, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say M, I should use the correct terminology. The A value for chlorine is given as 35.5. That's because about about uh, you know twenty five percent of uh, of naturally occurring chlorine has this nuclide. Sorry, seventy five percent. I beg your pardon. Seventy five percent has this nuclide, and about twenty five percent of naturally occurring chlorine has this much. Uh, the, uh, 30, uh, has a nucleon number of thirty seven. So it's really interesting. Um, chlorine thirty five and chlorine thirty sevens are said to be. You know isotopes of chlorine so essentially isotopes are different forms of the same element which are have the same number of protons but different number of uh, neutrons in the nuclei um, some elements have many many isotopes others have a uh, have a have a few right um, you what you'll find is so one one uh, if you ever get into like you know nuclear engineering anything like that the one you're going to most commonly encounter is hydrogen right so you're going to have uh, hydrogen one you're also going to have deuterium you might, you'll have hydrogen two and you might have tritium also, you might encounter that as well. So tritium is the, you know, you have one proton and two neutrons. So I want you to just remember, you know, the term isotope is also used to um, uh, describe nuclei with the same proton number, but with different nucleon numbers. Um, you might also encounter the term nuclide as we just did in the previous uh, slide. So that is some definitions that I wanted to get through. Now that we've done that, we can start talking about more interesting things uh, like uh, radioactivity. Some elements have nuclei which are unstable. You know, the combination of protons and neutrons in the nucleus is such that the forces acting on the nucleons don't balance. And we'll talk about what these forces are in, in subsequent uh, videos, but just go with that for a second. Now, in order to become more stable, you know, you have to, re you have to release particles or you have to release uh, electromagnetic radiation. Such nuclei are said to be radioactive and this emission is called radioactivity. So it could be a par particle that's getting emitted or radiation. These emissions are invisible to the naked eye, but you can use a device that's called a cloud chamber um, to make these, uh, these emissions visible, the tracks of these emissions visible. Um, and you know when 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 this was first being studied they identified um, that there are three different types of emissions that are occurring and they are alpha particles beta particles and gamma radiations and all three of these emissions are originating from the nucleus so let's take a look at each one of them i'll start off with alpha particles so folks an alpha particle is essentially a helium nucleus and because it's just the nucleus it's actually you know you got to write it like this it's got a, ch a positive two charge uh, on it, right? Because there's no electrons there. It's just two protons and two neutrons. So therefore, it's going to carry a plus 2e electric uh, um, uh, electric charge. We find that these guys are, you know, uh, traveling at about 5% the speed of light. So that's their velocity. Um, so it's about, we're talking about, you know, 10 to the 7 meters per second. That's a property that I wanted to just highlight to you. 
That might seem like a lot, but in fact, alpha particles are the least penetrating of the three types of emission. So you can, you know, it'll pass through some a thin piece of paper, but it's unable to penetrate a thin card. So its range in air is uh, is a few centimeters. So it's a few centimeter range in air. It's important to say in air. Now, because these alpha particles are charged, they can be deflected by electric and magnetic fields, right? So again, it's identical to the nucleus of a helium atom and it can be written as that. Sometimes I've seen in some books, they write the two plus up there. Sometimes they omit the two plus. So they just write helium, you know, four on the top, two on the bottom. All right, so uh, as they travel, as the alpha particles travel through matter, Actually, sorry, let me write the other piece down. So they are uh, deflected by electric and magnetic fields. All right. So as alpha particles travel through matter, right, they're going to interact with nearby atoms and they'll cause them to lose one or more electrons. The ion that it's created and the dislodged electron are then called an ion pair. The production of an ion pair is going to require the separation of unlike charges, right? You're talking like, and remember, unlike charges want to attract. Uh, and therefore, this process is going to require energy. Where is this energy going to come from? Well, alpha particles, think about it. It's a helium nucleus, right? So it's a pretty, it's, it's uh, relatively speaking, it has a large mass and a large charge. And as a result of that, they're very efficient ionizers. They can produce as many as 100,000 ion pairs for every centimeter of air through which they travel. Consequently, because they're doing this, they're that massive, they're hitting all these other particles that they're interacting with, they're going to lose energy relatively quickly and they have low penetrating power. And that is why uh, they only have the range of a few centimeters in air. So when the nucleus of an atom has emitted an alpha particle, we say that it has undergone alpha decay. As a result of that, the nucleus is going to lose two protons and two neutrons in this emission. Let's look at an example. We'll look at uranium-234 as an example. So here, uranium-234 is an example of an atom that might emit an alpha particle, right? Um, th so the alpha particle gets released. There's your alpha right there, right? Also, some energy is getting released. But where's all the rest of the mass going? There's still 90 protons, right? And 230... Um, you know, 200, uh, 230 um, uh, nucleons essentially to account for. So what happens is, um, you know, you have, sorry, 230 here, we'll write 90 here, and wh what we find is the uranium is actually getting turned into thorium. So in, in this scenario, what do you say is that the uranium is the parent nuclide, and the thorium is the daughter nuclide. How do, I, how do I know this? It's because you know every element has a particular proton number. If you've undergone alpha decay, you have turned uranium into thorium. You have basically undergone uh, transmutation. In some books, you might see this terminology used for it, transmutation. You've, you've, you've changed, you know, like the medie medieval alchemists, what they were trying to do, well, they were, they were wrong, but essentially this is what, you know, alchemy looks like when it's supported by physics. You know, you know you've turned one, one uh, element into another element. Um, what we also find is just because you have the same number of neutrons and protons, the, 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 we, we're conserving that, right? So the 4 plus the 230 is equal to 234, and the 2 plus the 90 is equal to 92. That's fine. But there's something else that's happening. If you actually took the, um, you took the atomic weight uh, of all of these uh, nucleons, you're going to find that uh, the, uh, the atomic, uh, atomic uh, weight of the decay products is less than the mass of the parent nuclide. So the energy that you're seeing here, the energy equivalent of the difference in the mass, that is, uh, that is uh, where did that go? Right, it's you. Ha you had to have some kind of kinetic energy, where you would separate the alpha particle uh, and the uh, and the um, recoiling daughter nucleus from each other, right, and produce some kind of a ga gamma ray photon or something like that. So, 
there's no longer conservation of mass, but there is conservation of mass and energy together. You also need to have linear momentum conserved in, in this kind of a nuclear reaction, right? So the same amount of energy that's released in the decay of each nucleus um, uh, of, um, of uh, uranium-234, it, it's gonna get converted into the kinetic energy of the alpha particle and the, and the recoiling daughter uh, nucleus. Um, the alpha particles emitted from, from a particular radioactive nuclide will all have the same kin kinetic energy. So that's the important piece here, right? So the, I'm gonna write that, let me write that on the next slide here because you've run out of space. So this is a summary of what we were just talking about. I'm gonna leave it up here for a couple of seconds and uh, when you're ready, shift over to our next topic of discussion on beta particles. So a beta particle is produced when a radioactive uh, nucleus decays by emitting a, um, a negative electron, negatively charged electron, or a positively charged electron. So a positively charged electron is also known as a positron or an anti-electron. Um, but essentially, you know, these are fast-moving electrons or, or, or positrons. Now, remember, we, we said earlier, electrons are much less massive compared to, you know, protons. So it stands to reason that the speed of a beta particle is gonna be higher than the speed of an alpha particle. In fact, what you find is the speed of an electron is actually greater than 99% of the speed of light. They're pretty damn fast. Um, these particles have half the charge and are much less massive than alpha particles, right? What is this gonna do? As a result of this, they're gonna be much less efficient than alpha particles in producing ion pairs. However, they are far more penetrating than alpha particles, and they can, speed, uh, they can travel up to about a meter in air. Essentially, you know, this means that they can penetrate cards, they can penetrate sheets of aluminum up to a few millimeters thick. Um, also, just like alpha particles, they are elect affected by electric and magnetic fields, but there are important differences between the behaviors of alpha and beta particles. You know, beta particles carry negative charge or positive charge, and they could be deflected in the same direction as an alpha particle, or the opposite direction as an alpha particle. Also, because they're much less massive, they are going to experience a, a much larger deflection when moving at the same speed as an alpha particle. All right, so if we were to show this as an equation, let's take lead um, 214 as an example, right? So your lead is your parent nucleus in this case. Uh, it emits an, an, an uh, electron, it, it's emitting a, a beta particle, right? So we write the beta particle, there's no, uh, there's no um, uh, mass in there, relatively speaking, um, but, uh, but there is like, you know, you have to write the negative one there uh, because it's indicating like, you know, um, that you have a negative charge emission. So it's not so much for the mass, but, but you're writing it for the, ch the to balance out the charges. So if you want to ba balance it out on the right hand side of the equation, you have to write something that has 83, right? Because 83 minus one has to equal 82. So you have to write 83 up here, and up here, uh, down here, and up here you have to write 214 because 214 plus zero is gonna be equal to 214. As it turns out, this is an element called bismuth. Uh, so you can see here, your proton number has actually increased by one from compar uh, for, uh, for the uh, daughter nuclide compared to the parent nuclide. Uh, also, we, we, I didn't write it here, I'm gonna write it in a different color. But uh, what happens is you also have a neutrino being emitted. So the, the symbol that is used for a neutrino is mu here, and you write zero and zero like that, right? Um, these particles have no electrical charge and little or no mass, and they are emitted from the nucleus at the same time as the beta particle. Another example of this could be you start off with uh, phosphorus, um, like that. And uh, at this point, you've emitted a positron, right? So I'm gonna write that one as a plus one because a positron is gonna be a positively charged one, right? So this one is a positron, and this one was an electron. So just to show you an example with a positron, right? Again, same thing happens here. You have some kind of energy uh, being, uh, being released, and you have 
what, what are you gonna have here? This is gonna be pretty straightforward for you. You gotta write this as a 14, right? Because you the, the charges, uh, the positive charge, uh, charges have to balance out and the mass numbers have to balance out. So what is 14? 14 is silicon. Um, and then you also find that again, um, you have neutrino being released here. And I apologize for one mistake here. This was an anti-neutrino. So that right there is an anti-neutrino. And this is a neutrino. So you don't need to worry about that for this moment. Just I wrote it down just for the sake of completeness of uh, this equation. Uh, but no electrical charge on a neutrino, no mass, little mass on a neutrino, and they're emitted from the nucleus at the same time as the uh, as the alpha particle, as the beta particle. I beg your pardon. Uh, we said before that the nucleus contains protons and neutrons, right? Well, what is the origin of a beta particle? Well, a beta particle certainly is going to come from the nucleus, right? But it's not going to come from electrons that are outside the nucleus. The process for this type of decay is that just prior to beta emission, a neutron turns itself into a proton. So a neutron inside the nucleus is going to turn itself into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. So the ratio of protons to neutrons in the in the nucleus is changed, and that is what is making the daughter nucleus more more uh, stable. So essentially, if I was to write this equation, it would actually be, look a little bit like this. So you have a neutron, right? It looks like this. It's going to turn itself into a proton, right? And it's going to release uh, an electron or a, uh, or a beta particle, basically. And it's going to uh, release an antineutrino as well as some energy. And that is what ends up making the, the nucleus more stable. Um, a sim so this is how free neutrons are known to decay, but a similar process is happening for a, ne a neutron inside the, uh, the nucleus. In a positronic emission, we'll use a different color for this, in a positronic emission, you're gonna start off with uh, actually a proton. So your proton is decaying into a neutron and it's going to produce a, pro a positron as a result of that and it's going to release a neutrino as well as some energy so this is slightly different this is a this is a positronic emission in red and we were looking on the right hand side in blue at a electron emission uh, in the and, and, and as a result of this, you know, your positive electron and your neutrino are getting emitted from the nucleus. And you have one extra proton in the nucleus and one fewer proton uh, in the, in the uh, nucleus. Um, the positron is an antimatter particle, it, right? It's very, very quickly going to meet its equivalent uh, matter particle, the negatively charged electron, and they're very quickly gonna annihilate each other to produce gamma radiation. This is what is going to make it very difficult for you to actually detect a positron, but this is how we believe the, uh, you know, mathematically how the process plays out. So the atomic mass of your decay products is less than the mass of the parent nucleus, right? The energy equivalent of the difference in the mass is shared between the kinetic energy of the beta particle and the daughter nucleus and the energy of the neutrino or the antineutrino as the case may be. Therefore, together, energy and mass are being cons conserved. Uh, and the same amount of energy is released in the decay of each and every parent nucleus. However, uh, the electrons that are emitted from a particular radionuclide do have varying amounts of kinetic energy. This amount of energy is going to depend on the total energy that's uh, available. Uh, uh, sorry, this amount of energy depends on the way that the total available energy is shared between the electron and the neutrino. But the sum of the electron's energy and the neutrino's energy should be constant for a particular nuclide. All right, so that brings us to the end of this video. I'm gonna continue our uh, discussion on radioactivity uh, in, in the next uh, video. So I'll see you there. Uh, thank you for watching.